Watch this. A high-ranking Boise police officer is wrapped up in allegations of racism by California cops that were under his command. BPD Deputy Chief Tammany Brooks is being sued in federal court for something he did or didn't do back when he led a Northern California Police Department. Brooks was chief of Antioch Police Department from 2017 to 2021, which he came to Boise PD in October of that year. That's 2021. Six people who dealt with law enforcement in Antioch have sued Brooks and eight other officers, as well as the city of Antioch, for civil rights violations. The suit comes after a district attorney's investigation found these California officers sent derogatory and racist texts about people who live there in the town, in the city, between 2019 and 2022. The lawsuit filed in federal court Wednesday alleges police shared, quote, homophobic and sexually explicit language and photographs, end quote. It also alleges officers celebrated the targeting of black people. The federal lawsuit claims Brooks was aware of officers openly racist misconduct and alleged excessive force. It also claims Brooks didn't do anything to prevent any of it. Meanwhile, the Boise Police Department celebrated his diversity or their diversity when they hired Brooks back in August of 2021. In fact, two months ago on Instagram, BPD said Brooks is the first black deputy chief in the department and his bio, meanwhile, says he prioritizes strengthening the relationship between the department and the people it serves and working to make Boise a safe and welcoming community for all, which is, by the way, what the Boise City said when they hired him, which is what they said Brooks brought to the Department of Antioch. Well, we reached out to both looking for comment, but they have not gotten back to us yet. Neither has the Antioch Police Department. So we'll stay tuned to this because obviously this is a developing situation with a lot of players involved, and we'll see what they may have to say about it. Okay, so yesterday we talked a bit about recently passed property tax relief and how the state of Idaho kicked some money back to local governments to then pass those savings on to you. $355 million in the first year, $110 million for the next two years following. So part of that is going to go straight back to owners of homes and land that they live in these homes, by the way. It's going to come back in the form of a tax credit if they already qualify for the homeowner exemption. The other part is supposed to go towards local school districts to pay for their bonds and levies, of which is a big reason a lot of property taxes go up because they pass these bonds and levies or they just get them and then they pass those taxes to pay for them on to property owners. So property owners are going to first feel this relief beginning December of this year. And of course, just what percentage of relief you receive depends 100% on where you live. So we didn't get the hard numbers yesterday when we talked about this because all of that will be decided by local taxing, taxing districts. But what we did talk about did lead to this question from Steve. He asks, is the circuit breaker still available to assist in property tax relief? So the circuit breaker is a short way to refer to the property tax reduction program in Idaho that is offered by the state and when that sort of rebate kicks in. The short answer to your question, Steve, is yes, it is still available. This new property tax bill actually relaxed some of those qualifications, by the way. First, to be qualified for the circuit breaker, you have to be 65 years of age or older. You also have to be blind, widowed, or disabled. You have to hit all of these points. You have to also either be, you could be, I should say, a former prisoner of war or a hostage or a single parent with a kid under 18. Your total income for 2022 past the medical expenses has to be $37,000 or less. They kind of bumped that up with this new bill because it used to be around $33,000. You also have to have owned that acre of land or lived in that home before April 15th, which was last Saturday. And if you satisfy all of that, well, you could get anywhere from $250 to $1,500, a reduction on those property taxes. So yes, even with the new property tax relief passed by lawmakers, the circuit breaker is still in play. And we promised yesterday we're going to try to break it down even further as we get further out, figure out from a local community, say a county or a taxing district, and find out specifically how that tax may or the tax rebate may apply to you. So stay tuned for that.
secrets of the skies in the drop of rain. Look around, just look around. Full of silver and surprise if you look around, just look around. In 1970, mankind took time to worry about and to pay tribute to the planet. Okay, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop on. Wait, wait, wait I think we probably should explain this. It is kind of a weird way to come out of that, right? But that, that time warp and that glorious song you just heard by Sergio Mendez and Brazil 66, by the way, well, that comes from our KTVB archives. And as you heard, 1970 was the first year for Earth Day, the birth of the modern day environmental movement. America at the time was suffering from suffocating air pollution. Litter was everywhere, dirty rivers, including one that actually caught fire in Cleveland in 1969. Inspired by an oil spill off the coast of Santa Barbara, California, a senator from Wisconsin, that'd be Senator Gaylord Nelson, well, he's credited with helping launch the first Earth Day on April 22nd, 1970, 53 years ago tomorrow. Our KTVB crew captured and commemorated the iconic and inaugural moment with this little ditty. All the secrets of the skies in the drop of rain. Look around, just look around. Full of silver and surprise if you look around, just look around. In 1970, mankind took time to worry about and to pay tribute to the planet Earth. The Ecology Crusade reached its zenith on April 22nd, the first national observance of Earth Day. A day dedicated to the protection of mankind's land, its air, and its water. Young and old alike joined forces to clean up litter and to dramatize the need to end pollution. Critics questioned the motivation and the economic impact of some of the demands of the crusade. Interior Secretary Walter J. Hickel made a tour of the Upper Snake River with celebrities Arthur Godfrey and Burl Ives during Earth Week. During that trip, Hickel visited students staging a week-long camp-in to dramatize what life could be like in reasonably unpolluted surroundings. We're up there really just to further education, and I think that uh, with all the academic training you get in the university, any university, I think the real education is to get out uh, and see those areas of nature like they were doing. I think it's a real plus. Okay, so, well, the Sergio Mendez aside, that was back 53 years ago. That first Earth Day celebrated by 20 million Americans across 10,000 schools and 2,000 college campuses, by the way, where they called them teach-ins at the time. Even at the University of Idaho, where they held outdoor lectures, instructors were urged to devote some time in their classes to discussing the environmental problems facing mankind. And that was also when this, uh, this is also back when it was Boise State College, remember that, back in 1970, not Boise State University, just, and right between the Boise State, well, Junior College, several, Boise Junior College. Several guys from the Beta, Beta Sigma Phi fraternity helped move old cars from the Boise foothills back on that weekend, which were likely then, and probably promptly, re relocated to the Boise River to help with erosion and stuff. Okay, so some other background on what you saw in that old film from 1970. The Interior Secretary, Walter Hickel, actually encouraged President Nixon the December before to declare Earth Day a national holiday. Well, Nixon didn't, and it still isn't a national holiday, but it did help get environmental issues onto that national agenda. And on December 2nd of 1970, Congress authorized the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or we know it as the EPA. Okay, back to Hickel. Two weeks after visiting Idaho, which we showed you in that film there, during Earth Week in 1970, he actually wrote a letter to President Nixon that eventually led to him getting fired from the cabinet later that year. And in that letter, he criticized Nixon's invasion of Cambodia and how he handled the student protest at Kent State with the Ohio National Guard shooting into a crowd and killing four people. Remember that? Well, that letter, Hinkle wrote, I believe this administration finds itself today embracing a philosophy which appears to lack appropriate concern for the attitude of a great mass of Americans, our young people. Pretty poignant. He added in that letter, regardless of how I or any American might feel individually, we have an obligation as leaders to communicate with our youth and listen to their ideas and problems. Perhaps through such conversations, we can gain greater insight into the problems confronting us all. And most important, he said, into the solutions of these problems. Hickel was fired six months later on Thanksgiving for writing that letter. 
Well, that pressing idea of needing to involve the youth in solving the problems of the world, it didn't go anywhere, but it hasn't always been heard. It's certainly getting better, though, especially when it comes to environmental issues. While going green has been going strong for generations, it's always up to the next generation to kind of keep it going. And tonight in Boise, those ideas are being discussed at the 32nd Annual Society of Environmental Journalists Conference. It's a group that couldn't be more self-descriptive. Just say it out loud, you know what they do. They hold this conference at different places each year. And this year, the Conservation Voters of Idaho, or for Idaho, I should say, well, they're hosting this group at Boise State. So why did they pick here? It's no secret there's a decent chunk of Idahoans who don't believe in things like climate change or global warming. But the organizers of the conference think that's exactly why we should have something like this in Boise. The conference is in Boise is because uh, Boise Mayor Lauren McLean, when she was a city councilwoman, uh, was had a chance meeting in a bar in Pittsburgh, no, had a chance meeting in a restaurant in Pittsburgh uh, with some of the SEJ members and said, you're having an environmental conference in Pittsburgh? Come to Boise. The reason we're happy to be here is because it turns out that Idaho has been doing some really interesting, innovative, um, cr across the political divide. Uh, and that's the theme of our conference is the kinds of solutions that people have worked out um, even when they're somewhat hostile to government. Okay, so the theme here is crossing the divide, urban growth and the wild, something the executive director of Conservation Voters for Idaho says could not have come at a better time for Idaho. Outside of a political arena, um, when we actually get on the ground and talk to our neighbors and, and we get engaged in our community, we know that there are solutions to these challenges, both in the way in which we can innovate, but also the way that we can partner together. And it's really exciting to see um, the, the space that we have built to bring those many voices together to create those solutions. Solutions to such things as rapid growth while still protecting the lands that make Idaho, Idaho like protecting our salmon and steelhead or the ever expanding wildfire season, things that actually impact more than just the environment. Those are the kind of things that do that. And they actually impact our economy as well. In the end, Tom thinks despite party lines, Idahoans, we all care about the same things. You, you hear people say, you know, Idaho is a red state, but it's purple when people talk about the environment. That's because folks from across this urban and rural political and cultural divide all get together to you know, save public lands, to save wilderness areas, to think about clean water and clean air, which are some of the top environmental issues. And these issues, these environmental journalists and political leaders have been learning about around the state this week. They've kind of traveled around and seen it all kind of firsthand. All right, here's another way you can kind of join in, join in on the Earth Day fun. You don't have to be a scientist or even a journalist. All you gotta do is wanna drink some beer. Lost Grove Brewing is hosting its second annual Shade City Brew Fest that's today and tomorrow out at the Idaho Botanical Garden, the sustainable beer filled party. 70s themed, 70s themed, of course it is. That's because that's when it all started, right? There's gonna be beer from local brewers and a lot of people who just wanna talk about ways individuals and businesses can reduce our impact on the environment, maybe reuse some things, maybe even talk about some recycling or whatever comes to mind. That brew fest is gonna go from tonight, from well, right about now till nine, then tomorrow from one to six. Got to be 21 or older, of course, so don't bring the kids to this one. But you can get tickets, and they start at $20 online.
So just keeping the track of the records, uh, just showing you here the temperatures, how we've gone from warm weekends down to cool weeks, back to warm weekends. This will make the third weekend of a warm weekend. If you go back, here's a, here we go two weeks ago, and you can see how those temperatures, you remember that day of 82? And then you can see how the temperatures dropped. Now they came back up again last weekend. They're dropping, and guess what? They're gonna come back up again as we look ahead to this weekend. So for tomorrow and tonight, you can see these temperatures down into the 50s. For tomorrow, uh, by later in the afternoon, we should be somewhere close to about 60 degrees, no showers. Showers at this time are pretty much to our east. There's a few scattered sprinkles, uh, but not much out there. Most of it happens to be to our north, and even that isn't a lot to talk about. So that's in our satellite picture. When you look at our seven-day forecast, notice that Saturday, 60, 67 degrees for Sunday. It looks pretty nice. So those temperatures are coming back up again, but then another storm. We've had three Monday storms, you know, for each Monday, for the last three Mondays, I should say, that brought about rain. We're going to do it again. This drops the temperature down to anywhere from about 58 to 61. And then when you look at Tuesday and Wednesday, you can see these temperatures getting up into the 60s. Look at this for Thursday and Friday. High temperatures are now into the lower 70s. So now we're kind of breaking that every weekend, getting warmer. We're going to see these temperatures getting warmer as we get into Wednesday, Thursday, as well as Friday. So here's the temperature trend for the next 10 days. So you see these temperatures in the 60s to near 70. And then by Wednesday it comes up. Here's Thursday. Here's Friday. You see these temperatures around 70. It lasts into next weekend. And for, war, for what we can see right now, they're likely going to continue even into the lower 70s for the following week. So you know the really nice temperatures in the 60s and the 70s? There they are, okay? Nighttime lows. Well, we've been seeing some real freezing conditions. And for tomorrow morning, not quite freezing, but cold enough. Temperature down to 36. But when you look at this, you don't see too many temperatures into the 30s. We get into the 40s at night. And next week, those temperatures at night will basically be into the upper 40s to getting near 50 degrees. It's going to be a change. And the likelihood we have to watch those rivers because all the snow melting, that's warming up as we get into next week. You know, it's probably the dream of any artist to get a point in their career where they can open their own gallery. Well, for Boris Bill Garibian, he realized that dream when he opened the Idaho Art Gallery in Meridian a little more than a year ago. It took him a long time to get there, though. Bill grew up in a city of two million people by the Caspian Sea, the son of an artist of the Soviet Union Art Society. Yeah, he grew up in the Soviet Union. He realized his calling as a painter was, well, he got there because he was watching his father work. In 1991, just before the fall of the Soviet Union, at the age of 38, Bill moved his family to Twin Falls. An artist already, he had to put that aside as a profession to put food on the table, finding jobs in construction, even though he barely had any experience with a shovel. His passion for painting was always there, though, and he did, it was something he always did, which is why when he finally opened his gallery, he knew he wanted it to be an opportunity for others, too. Oh, I love Idaho landscape because it's, you have variety of landscapes, you know, you have the mountains, you have the rivers, you have the lakes, canyons, and the forest, and the desert, farm field, we have everything here. We have beautiful skies in Idaho, you, you will not find any, any better skies in the over United States, you know. That appreciation for the outdoors, Bill Garabian gleaned from his father. I was in his studio since I was a little kid, <laughs> running around, playing with the toys. He was painting outside, I was little, watching him, you know, and we were going to countryside, I was watching him too. That's how I fell in love with the landscapes. So I decided if I will be a painter, I'll paint only landscapes only. <laughs> it's in the South Hills. It's South Hills near Twin Falls, yeah. There's a little creek over there, and that, I saw that little bridge. I like painting the fields, open fields, I don't know, it's a feeling. It's a feeling, open. It's open area, you know, it's like ocean. You can see ocean, it's open. This week, Bill is opening his gallery to other artists. We have a watercolor painter, oil painter, acrylics, you know, it doesn't matter. Even works with wax. It's called encaustic. It's from the Egyptian mummies and the tombs. A medium Barbara Michener has honed for two decades. And just a corner of this on a hot palette. You can boil the chemicals together of the colors, or you can score and fill in with other colors, or you can do a monoprint 
just by laying it on the palette and pulling it up, and that's what you get. I love nature. I grew up in nature. I incorporate a lot of nature in what I do. I'm influenced by it, the texture and the color and the line and the, just everything. I like the irregular pieces. To which she gives obvious titles. Why'd you call that one Applebee's? Because it has apples and beehive in it. And the bees ate the apple. So that was actually a, an apple in your yard? Yes. And you just put wax on it? Yes, I put wax on a lot of things. Mostly on canvas, but also on driftwood or in bowls. It's my mental therapy. It's what I love. As for why Bill paints? I don't know, it's something here inside told me you have to paint. You know, you have to paint, I don't know why. Because what he puts into it. Later I find out why. Usually comes back. When people buy my paintings, it makes them happy. There are two artist receptions tonight and tomorrow at the Idaho Art Gallery in Meridian. Tonight's is going to go till 8. Tomorrow's will be from 11 to 6. And you can even meet the artists and maybe take one of their pieces home. I right, speak of something to do, music lovers, or should I say melomaniacs, which is what you call somebody who's got a great enthusiasm for music. Tomorrow is record store day. Record exchange is ready to go, I don't know, maniac, maniacal for melomaniacs. Is that how you'd say that? I think so. All right, to celebrate the record store in Boise, downtown, we'll have 300 exclusive releases from different artists available. Swifties, that includes you. Fun fact, though, the Recording Industry Association of America says vinyls have overtaken CDs in sales. Probably not surprising to a lot of people because a lot of people may not even know what a CD is, which is why in 2022, 41 million vinyl records were sold compared to just 33 million CDs. And this is the first time this has happened since 1987.
All right, let's wrap up this Friday with your comments today. I think I may have mixed up some of my ands and ors, according to Martin here. Circuit break is available if you're 65 or older. You don't have to be blind or other things, as I mentioned in your report. Yes, so let me clarify what that means really quickly. 65 years or older, or, or you, you're blind, widowed, disabled, a former POW or hostage, or a single parent of somebody under the age of 18. You don't have to be all of those, all of those things, but... If you part of that, then you qualify for the circuit breaker account. One of those, not and and or, not and, it's or. That's what I meant to say. Is that cleared up? I don't know. Thanks for the Hickel story. Sad but relevant. Today's GOP is working tirelessly to oppress the votes, views of the young. You might remember we did have a committee chair that said we don't want to listen to the people who are under the age of 18. So take that with you. We'll see you on Monday.